right uh, good evening uh, everyone and hope uh, everybody is doing well and staying safe uh, welcome to a live e panel discussion on redefining businesses and economies as part of the ema partners leadership conversation series it's an absolute honor to have three extremely accomplished board members and leaders on the panel with us who will take us through some very interesting data points and thoughts on the topic that we would all converse on today let me now introduce the panel members uh, we have mahir abu zaid mahir if you can just wave i think you're visible um, hi guys thank you uh, mahir has been a senior leader in the global healthcare industry currently the operating partner and board member with a large global healthcare private equity and vc organization called tvm healthcare mahir is also the acting ceo of amica technologies one of the largest subsidiary companies uh, or portfolio companies of tvm and he has he was previously the president and ceo of g healthcare for middle east africa turkey and some of the other eastern growth regions thanks mahir for joining us really appreciate it thank you Hi. for the invite looking forward like west mahir next we have uh, rajiv kakkar a seasoned senior banker and a board member with leading financial institutions and has been the global founder of fullerton financial and dunia finance in the past and also the former ceo of citibank turkey middle east and africa thanks rajiv for joining us it's it's an absolute pleasure and honor thank you thanks amarjit and then we have trey gary the board member and founder of various successful technology companies and is also the current uh, leader of the organization of the origination investment and portfolio management arm of saudi aramco entrepreneurship center thanks to tan trey for joining us from saudi arabia uh, it's an absolute honor and pleasure for all of us thank you very much thank you sir uh, and of course thank you so much audience for joining us i see the numbers going up i think registrations are picking up quickly uh we have in fact people from across regions today who have joined us from europe we have people from from southeast asia we also have of course a lot of people from the middle east uh thank you so much uh, the audience for joining us on this webinar on this live webinar thank you for your time uh just a few ground rules so that we can make the best of the time that we have together uh we will have the panel discussion for about 45 minutes and then followed up with our question answer session for about 15 odd minutes um uh, friends in the audience uh please type in your questions on the q&a panel that you have right below on your screen um and we will try our best to take as many questions towards the end um uh, unless we are affected by um, any technological glitches beyond our control we should be able to go well over the next 60 minutes or so um for the panelist uh Maher Rajiv and uh, Trey I might just intervene at times to utilize the time effectively during your conversations uh I hope you are still my friend after I do that um uh, great um I see a few questions coming in uh gentlemen in the audience friends we'll just take those questions towards the end thank you very much for your interest uh great um Rajiv Trey and Maher uh for the last two and a half months Uh, we have all endured a global lockdown and i believe that we are witnessing early signs of some kind of outdoor routine and changing sentiments there is a general positive sentiment on the wheels being somewhat back on the track as senior board leaders like yourselves having high impact responsibilities constantly trying to work on the company's sustainability protecting shareholder value and guiding the executive management teams how is the mindset of people within your respective organizations portfolio companies boards rajiv would you want to take that ahead first sure ramajit i i'll um, what i can say is uh, i'm as expected i guess and i'll speak a lot for the financial services sector the level of preparedness uh, has obviously grown as the as the crisis uh, intensified the good part is financial services companies in general prepare very well for continuity of business and when this crisis first uh, uh, happened in china there was a belief that the crisis would remain in china however uh, banking in the in the banking and financial services businesses uh, there is a general awareness that should a pandemic spread uh, or should the crisis spread because crises spread very quickly and especially when there are uh, any kind of physical crisis it can lead to an economic crisis there is a need to be ready for continuity of business 
So there was a very rapid period between Jan to uh, early March where I, uh, where most of the companies and the leaders have focused a lot in building on the continuity of business, business plan, pandemic preparedness to make sure that there's continuity. And then of course, from the moment uh, the WHO declared it as a formal pandemic and numbers started growing up and there was a lot of monitoring, uh, the execution of some of the elements of the pandemic crisis plan happened. And I saw a lot of positivity. In terms of quick learnings, I guess the focus is obviously on executing a plan. There's always a challenge when a plan is made in executing it. But more importantly, it was in the communication with staff. It was communication with employees, making sure that people get used to the new uh, set of practices. There was a lot of effort that went in. But at the same time, huge amount of focus went in to look at opportunities. It wasn't really about, you know, bogging yourself down with risks that were so apparent. But what was more important was to look at things. Um, they, you know, the glass is always... Uh, twice as big as I love to say. So I, I think uh, uh, there was a lot of focus around risk management, franchise management, making sure that uh, you know we had adequate liquidity. The central banks did a great job there. But uh, at the same time, there was an active focus within the teams to look at strengthening relationships with good clients, figuring out where the opportunities were. You've got to remember there are winners and losers in this sector. So not oh. everyone loses. There are some people who are going to gain a lot. So smart oh. businesses and a lot of focus has gone in there. Sure. Uh, thanks, Rajiv. Uh, you spoke about opportunities and smart businesses. I think opportunities in the healthcare sector, Mahir, has seen an upward spike. Uh, uh, would love to hear your thoughts for the viewers and all of us. Look, uh, the healthcare sector was in the middle of the crisis. There, there is no doubt that now everybody is looking forward for a gradual opening up uh, because from the healthcare perspective, being in the heart of the crisis, these guys, they need room to breathe. They've been working day and night fighting for COVID. So, so now healthcare worker, whether it is supplier or hospitals, they need some room to breathe. When it comes to the healthcare industry in general, we, we are getting ready to open up. Some of the sectors in the healthcare industry were doing better than others. Look, for instance, on all the healthcare industry that is related to elective surgery that has been freezed or put on hold. If you are a supplier or if you are a healthcare provider working on elective surgeries for the past two, three months, you're out of business. And mm -hmm. these guys, they're looking forward to come back and, and start resuming the business. So everybody now is getting ready, getting prepared. And the major focus will be on increasing revenue growth. The major focus is on managing the cash flow that was hurt for the past two, three months and getting ready with the new enablers to manage the new normal. Uh, looking at the, the portfolio of company that we have in TVM, we had two companies in the middle of, of the, the crisis. The, the company that I'm managing manufacturing catheter, we are producing catheter for ICU. So we had to work on two, three shifts. We have home care business also that were like overwhelmed with the demand. At the same time, we have a business that is on disease management like diabetes and on service like IVF. We didn't have much patient the past two, three months. So, so everybody is, is like looking to manage with the new normal and looking to start opening up gradually. Yeah, I think and, and new normal and the various aspects that you spoke about healthcare are primarily related to technology. And uh, I think Trey, uh, right up to your, uh, your forte, technology and you know, supporting fresh ideas and aspiring entrepreneurs uh, through a great venture that you're doing at Saudi Ramco. What have been your thoughts? And what are your thoughts on the mindset of the people that you've been dealing with uh, across the globe? Yeah, um, let me start here in, in predominantly Saudi. Yeah, there are winners and losers. Um, I mean, there's been some, some recent press about layoffs in the technology sector. Uh, it, it's, a, it's not quite a funny story yet, but a, a very large transaction that I'm aware of taking place in the region. Um, you know, they sat down, I, I'm not on the board of this company, but they sat down as a management team and a board and said, you know, in January, what's the worst thing that could happen? Uh, you know, could they come in and lock down our city? And it seemed at that point in January, like there was still no way, you know, Rajiv said it, it appeared to be stuck in China for at least the start. Um, and fast forward to today, the transaction's still on, thank, thank God. Um, but the mindset you know, with, with most of the companies that I'm working with is, is generally positive. You know, I haven't been stuck in a, a ride sharing, you know, deal that, that doesn't work in, in the new normal that we're living in right now. Um, 
but the same time I've, I've got young sometimes first time ceos that are experiencing this as business leaders as chairman and ceo of, of companies uh, for the first time so there's a, a bit of a case of they don't know what they don't know uh, and it's it's my job to kind of share with them experiences from the dot-com crash for example I've got limited exposure to SARS and what happened with that, you know, not necessarily here, but um, in the East. And it's, it, I'm, I'm fortunate that, you know, our technology, the, the companies that I'm working with in technology have, have been able to capitalize or, or stay, you know, status quo. And I, I believe they'll come out on the back end, mm. you know, once we get back to normal. Okay. Yeah. And I think uh, I think it's a very important point that you made. Uh, I think uh, you know the new CEOs and of course the chair the chairpersons of the respective organizations that you work with uh, have always been looking up to the boards uh, for the right governance. You know, it's always a saying that uh, good boards work on great governance and do not wait for crisis to pass before starting to assess opportunities that have been created. Um, what kind of forward-looking opportunities do you see in your respective sectors uh, and beyond? Uh, do you see potential possibilities in completely redefining certain businesses? Um, uh, Mahir, would you want to take that first? Look, um, let me talk about uh, the, the healthcare sector. The, all the healthcare system across the globe has been challenged. Yeah. There is no doubt that all the government are looking into their healthcare system and seeing area of improvement and revamping, whether it is well-developed country or an emerging market. So everybody is looking to see opportunities within healthcare. And there is no doubt that there is opportunities everywhere. Healthcare sector has been and always uh, will be a kind of a resilient sector mm -hmm. in terms of uh, financing and funding and investment, investing in healthcare. We saw immediately during the crisis, lots of opportunities mushrooming, the telemedicine, the telehealth, the home care business, uh, the PPE, uh, uh, ventilators, these are a need product that immediately you start having a, a venture capitalists injecting money and companies mushrooming in these sectors. At the same time, when you took one step back and look at the healthcare sector going forward, I mentioned a little bit the elective surgery, surgeries. There have been a really major hit to the patient, to the service provider, and to medtech companies with holding the elective surgeries. Now there is serious discussion among healthcare providers should we have these elective surgeries within the boundaries of a hospital or should we have these as ambulatory surgical center outside of the hospital, like a day care centers or the day care surgeries? Yes. Should we have these outside so if anything happens, they will not be impacted? If I'm a cancer patient, I need, still need to take my treatment. Whether there is COVID or not, I still need to go to the hospital and be able to take my treatment. It's the same for dialysis and you can go on and on and on. Yeah. Going forward, after this COVID, we realized that screening is, is crucial. Health screening facilities and early detection is going to be one of the core area of the healthcare system yeah. to be able to detect at early stages and act upon early stages. Countries at the country level, they realize that with the challenge on the supply chain, they realize that they need to have in country for the country some production. So local manufacturing is one of the opportunities that countries are looking at when it comes to healthcare. And you can go on and on and on when it comes to opportunities in healthcare. Yeah. And I also see that there's a lot of shift between uh, you know, single sourcing to multi-sourcing uh, since you spoke about supply chain. And I think, yeah. I think that kind of cut, cuts across FMCG or, or any consumer-based manufacturing or logistics uh, company. Talking about uh, the entire uh, upheaval of healthcare, of course, that would also be governed by the right governance, in, organize, in countries and with the right amount of fund or capital that's being injected. Uh, Rajiv, uh, what would be your thoughts uh, from a board member perspective uh, you know, when you have your discussions with multiple boards across banks and financial institutions? Uh, how have they think, responded to the situation? Of I think, you know, having been through several crises in my own career, uh, you know, whether crisis is driven by war or it's driven by something like the dot com crisis or even the last bank credit crisis and now this. Yeah. Uh, there are certain things which don't change in a crisis, especially on the banking side uh, and the financial services side. 
you know, banks and commerce being so critical, cash flows being so critical almost to every industry, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, whether it's um, uh, commodities, it's hydrocarbons or whatever else you may talk about. So um, the elements that do not change uh, are the factors that there is always a demand for business. But what changes is the railroad that is getting created between every two crises. And there is massive shift in terms of how behavior is changing. I, what, is, what is coming through is that every period of shift, for instance, if you look at 2001, when 9-11 happened, it actually led to a shift and realization that there was an external market and emerging mar market banking actually became one of the big, big things in the world with the famous BRICS report. And that led to the opportunity of us creating Fullerton and a fund where we were focusing on emerging markets. And, and we realized that the best way and the best proxy for growth for the emerging market um, uh, uh, wealth creation was yeah. really the proxy in the, in the emerging middle class. Yeah. In 2008, it was a massive correction and fixing of banks. And then there was a realization that banks need to be safer. And it was easier for the governments to go out and fix it because they could infuse a lot of liquidity and they could support the banks. And the government became the backstop. In the period between 2008 and 2020, there's been massive development around, um, you know, internet, bandwidth, mobility devices. Uh, people are talking about telemedicine and all this rides on the backbone of uh, a lot of uh, bandwidth as well as a lot of devices and a lot of stuff reaching out. But very clearly, there's a focus around inclusion and inclusive finance is becoming something which is very, very critical. Inclusive finance is needed for increasing the buying power of people at the same time, it is also needed to be able to make sure that all these factories in the world can actually sell their products and reach it to the people who need them. So uh, the difference, of course, this time around is that uh, the governments are not the, going to be the backstop. The governments, this is a health crisis, which has become an economic crisis, and the governments can only do so much. So the opportunities ahead are, of course, the standard of opportunities of consolidation. There will be some players that will be merged. There will be opportunities to restructure portfolios. There will be an opportunity to see the winners and the losers and go back and refocus on losers. But I think there will be a far more focus today on partnership, creating new alliances. I think we will see, a, uh, the, you know, we're seeing new regulations around open banking. You're seeing regulations around uh, PSD2, which has come into Europe. It's coming into many parts of the world. This will become a reality. If we keep consolidating balance sheets, and even in the Middle East, we've seen a lot of that. How are we going to get down to reaching the lowest level? As banks become bigger and bigger, they'll become more distant from the masses. And issues today are not economic and financial alone. They're social and political. And you're seeing social issues today in America, in the US. And when those issues surface, political actions need to be taken. So there'll be a lot more focus on digitization, a lot of collaboration between technology companies and finance. I think tech fin or fintech, whichever word you prefer, will re research. There'll be massive business process management um, uh, opportunities where a lot of the subscale infrastructure that exists in the middle office and back office will need to get integrated. So you will find specialized companies coming into it, but um, there'll be a focus on resilient, resilience, uh, uh, building resilience on personalization and uh, a lot of data driven decision making. But the, the software elements is what is important. And I'd just like to close off with that point. I'm a big fan of governance and uh, talent. You see these software elements are what are very, very critical. Yeah. And, and this is the time the men and the boys will uh, we separated out. Companies will realize the importance yet again of the importance of process controls, risk management, diversification, concentrations, governance, getting talented people, ensuring that there is segregation of responsibilities and independence of opinion. Mm -hmm. and, um, and good talent will come back at a premium and companies with governance will always be at a premium. So if I look at the entire chain, I think there are opportunities galore. And uh, finance being at the center, finance being the necessary oxygen to almost every other sector, uh, I think there's going to be more excitement ahead, but lots of players are going to fall by the wayside. Of course, you know, thanks, thanks a ton for, for that, Rajiv. In fact, you did speak about digitization, uh, which we see today kind of cutting across uh, organizations horizontally. Um, uh, the next question, uh, Trey, I mean, uh, we have spoken about this before as well. Uh, Trey, you were in the US when the crisis hit back in 2007, eight. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of resilience that was shown by the government by multiple organizations then, uh, do you see some kind of parallels that would happen going forward uh, in the world economy? What are your uh, thoughts on those aspects? Yes. Um, Sorry, so I'm taking you back many years. Yeah, you, <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll scratch my memory. Um, 
I've been here for seven and a half and I do my best to, to stay up on the U.S., but I kind of had to relearn and, and embrace myself here in, in the region to do this job. Um, you know, I, I'm scratching my head, quite frankly, that the stock markets and oil is now, you know, at almost $40 if, if we're still in this pandemic. Uh, you know, for, for me, I'm, I'm quite relieved that, you know, the global economy is, is performing well. I don't know if that means that it's baked in with the huge hit that it took in February, and, but I'm still seeing growth. Uh, I'm not quite sure where it's coming from, and I know there's going to be you know, companies that, that go away, but for me, I'm, I'm you know, at least pleasantly surprised and, and cautiously optimistic about the prospects of, of you know, us hopefully getting better. And as long as there's not a huge second wave, huge second wave, there's going to be a second wave, in my opinion, to some degree. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that we can learn. I, I like the railroad between crises or recessions that Rajiv mentioned. Um, you know, I'm interested to know what that railroad is to the next one, but I, I think we might have some wheels on the track yeah. as, as we, Peak. You know, companies are doing things differently. They're, they're pivoting, uh, you know, in terms of companies that we've invested in, you know, e-commerce was a huge opportunity, but that thing's on steroids right now. And, and this time payments, you know, tech fin, fintech, um, we've got a payments company that's doing, you know, crazy growth. Uh, so there, there are silver linings and opportunities in this market. Yeah, no, and, and, and we clearly see that. I mean, we, of course, see a lot of rise in e-commerce, uh, you know, both on, on the transaction side and, of course, on the volume side. Uh, and definitely uh, there is a lot of focus across sectors that we see from us, from a global search firm, especially at the leadership level. Um, uh, speaking about uh, boards, and Rajiv, you also made a very pertinent point about uh, your affinity towards talent. We've had multiple discussions over the years where you've shown your, your interest about governance of talent. Um, I was just reading a note the other day uh, by Abraham Lincoln, you know, and he had once cautioned against changing horses midstream, however, keeping unmotivated or professionally unprepared people at the helm of a company at a time of profound and most likely prolonged crisis is probably more riskier. Um, globally, a lot of boards and organizations have also replaced the leadership teams in, which were in place earlier, uh, especially during a crisis. Um, what are your views on the changing landscape of talent uh, going ahead? Uh, uh, Rajiv, uh, let me start with you first. Thank you. Uh, Amarjeet, I have, I have pretty strong uh, views on talent as you, you know, I, I tend to believe if you use the word talent, then it should be used fairly. And talent to me is anyone with knowledge and skills that can you be used to create value that someone is willing to pay for. So uh, with due respect to uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, if any company, whether in crisis times, midstream and crisis, or even in good times when there's heavy tailwind, has people who are unmotivated or unstable to use the expression you did, or not physically able or not weak, then they should not be in that position for in the first place. So leadership that is not talented should never be given a chance, whether it's good times or bad times in my view. However, if you do have, and I think fun, when I talk about governance, one of the responsibilities of governance is not having committees. The importance of governance is getting involved in the aspects of running a healthy business. And, and, and there the important aspect is making sure you have the right kind of talent, both at the board level as well as the executive management. Right. And that's where the responsibilities of the three layers of any organization is important. The shareholders must pick a good board. The board must pick a good CEO. And the CEO must pick up a good executive team. And together, there must be music and they must orchestrate the play very well. This often does not happen. You don't want placeholder CEOs. So changing, when you're in the middle of a stress, it's all, you know, you're normally asked even in, the, in a plane or if you're in the middle of a crisis, stay at home. Do not try to change seats when you're in the middle of a crisis or turbulence. So why should you be changing your people at that point? The only reason you would do so if you have the wrong people on the top in which case, I, I would give negative marks to the people who, who put the leadership in place. Mm. The second thing is changing people, uh, you know, uh, massive uh, layoffs. Now, I, I have a strong view. I've been through at least seven or eight crises myself and very, very tough and in different countries. And I am fundamentally against it. Unless you have strong ethical reasons or something wrong. And 
unless a model has not been thought through. It's a leadership fail that you build a lot of corporate fat that needs to be shed off at the first sign of the crisis. However, if this is true corporate muscle, and if you are creating the right kind of talent, then actually this is the strength that will help you navigate out of talent. Thirdly, remember, crisis times don't last as long as good times do. Companies that are going to lead to disenfranchisement, frequent changes of leadership, frequent uh, firing, reflect a, a concept of distrust. And it also leads to a huge amount of disengagement with staff. What it leads to is a loss of what I think is essential to the fabric of a company, which is instilling a founder's mentality in almost every employee. If, you know, what do we do in a house? We all feel like we are part of the house and we own it. What do we do for our countries? We feel we are citizens and we feel strongly about it. So even employees, how do you make them engage that they feel like they're founders? They own, you know, the good and the bad. And it's times like these that good companies should be able to find a way for them to willingly come forward, perhaps take a cut, but you don't need to lay off 15,000 people. No. You don't need to lay off hundreds of people. And if you do that, then engage people with a founder's mentality are known to be more creative, more innovative, give more to the company in tough times and help create a greater amount of innovation and build back the company. Mm -hmm. And it also does not dilute the original purpose of the company. The only reason you need to do the reverse where you need to lay off is when you have bad leadership in the first place, in which case it's a fail of the board and it's a fail of the senior management. So hence, to me, I place a heavy amount of premium on continuity, especially in the middle of a stress or a turbulence. And of course, there are those tactical opportunities where, where you can get talent that you may not have. This is the right time to retool certain skills that may be available. This is the time to go out there and grab people and build your benchmarks. So those are standard tools, but you don't have to go out and change your leadership. You go out and augment your leadership. You go out and strengthen your leadership. You create benchmarks and you prepare for the next uh, takeoff point. Mm -hmm. uh, every tailwind, every point of adversity, and you know, I'll end here, comes with a huge opportunity ahead. And if that time you are going to be lean on muscle, mm -hmm. or you're going to be lean on intent, or you're going to be lean on a common purpose, then organizations are not going to succeed. And I can give you millions of examples. I'm sure you know many of them. And uh, I, 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 as, I have rarely needed to fire people. In fact, I've always, in, I remember the 2008 crisis, we had started so many companies in our fund. I was running one of them directly myself and I didn't fire anybody. And till date, that has led to a premium where people would gladly come and work with us. People gave, gave everything that they could and you could also reward them and get a greater continuity of return. No, fantastic, uh, Ji. I think uh, I think this is something that you know uh, all organizations always think about. Some of them get it right, um, uh, some of them don't. Uh, and I think what you spoke very importantly was the founders' mentality. I think that is something that clearly stood out. Uh, uh, talking about uh, employee responsibility and of course talent again, uh, Mahir. Uh, I think we were also talking the other day, Mahir, about, about various sectors and how they've been doing in this, in this situation. Now that we have kind of, you know, probably slowly limping towards version 2.0 uh, of, uh, I hate to use the word crisis, but of the situation. Um, and your sector, of course, being right at the helm. Uh, what are your thoughts about people, leadership, talent, from a board level, of course, because this has been your, your forte uh, for so many years. Uh, love to hear some thoughts around that. Look, I fully agree that uh, laying off people and restructuring is not an answer. If you need to have uh, engaged and motivated employee, you need to feel that they are part of the organization. They need to start treating this business as if it's their own business versus like uh, uh, we keep telling the employees that you are number one priority and you are our number one asset. And number two are our customer and number three are shareholders. But we've seen in 2008 crisis when shareholder jumped to number one and shareholder were not happy with the free cash flow, the first uh, layer that we started attacking and, and reducing is the employees that we've been talking and saying they are our number one assets. So I fully agree that if we need to have sustainability and we need to have continuity, we need to have motivated, passionate employees believing that this is their own business that they run. This yeah. is one. Two, when it comes to talent and skill and experience, after the 2008 crisis, we had the same, the same discussion around skills and, and talent. And we realized that all this is great, but we had to create a solution as we go. And the solution didn't come off the shelf. And we were looking at people that they can adapt fast, they can pivot, learn fast, new tricks, and move ahead. This is why we start looking into flexibility, adaptability, 
creativity in the people that we are putting in leadership positions. Because we need these guys, sometimes they're gonna be facing situation that there's no process, there's no system, there's no history to tell us how we, we deal with it. And they need to be creative, they need to act fast, sense of urgency, and they need to pivot when it's not working. And the life example, what's happening now with COVID, many decisions were taken in terms of creativity, repurposing hospital bed to become ICU, repurposing a machine to become a ventilator, working on creativity in terms of how can we accommodate the huge surge in number of cases of, of COVID and how can we make it happen. So mm -hmm. all this, you need somebody that is passionate, flexible, adaptable, and lots of creativity. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's uh, that's very interesting. I think creativity is something that is 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 has been. I mean, creative juices have been flowing to the highest value for a lot of us during this period. And again, you know, I would just like to spend maybe a couple of more minutes on this very important topic about talent and people. Um, Trey, um, I mean, you work with high potential and aspirational entrepreneurs and uh, and and talent across, uh, and of course, you know, SMEs who are key contributors to job creation and uh, people who actually represent a major source of employment. Uh, what is your take on the new venture startup ecosystem, uh, both on the business and of course, on the people front as well? Yeah, just to, to touch on what uh, my two colleagues shared, you know, in, in the cases of these venture backed companies that I typically work with, the CEOs of the companies and, and chairmen of the board are it's their company they still own and in a lot of cases the majority of the company so it's not impossible to make changes but um my, my ceos are still there and it's i think it's important for them to go through this as leaders and and give them those new experiences to make them better you know for the next one or when we come out of this so you know it's in a twisted way i'm, I'm enjoying watching them learn because it is their first time in this situation. Mm. Uh, I, I'll, I'll echo what, what one of the gentlemen said, you know, we are, not that we had fat to trim, you know, but now that we're in this crisis or pandemic, whatever we're gonna call it, but there are places where we're improving senior management. Um, you know, those decisions are a little bit easier now to, to trade. <laughs> um, and so, I have seen some of that, but my, my CEOs have, have stayed in place primarily because they're the founders. And, you know, we talked about the passion of the employees. You know, these people started the business and they've lost their hair like I did, you know, at an early age doing this crazy stuff. So I'm not worried about them getting lackadaisical or, or tuned out. You know, they're more concerned than I am about their business. Mm. Um, we talked about talent, you know, Again, this was the case in the in the dot com days, which maybe some of the participants on the on the panel or uh, out there in cyberspace are aware of. And there was a lot of talent that that was available with these mass you know, implosions and layoffs. And you know, there's you know large companies that have laid off people in the technology space, venture backed, without saying names. And there's there's a database of names of good people out there and support systems in place. And you know, we're able to pick up great quality people that, that unfortunately lost their jobs. So the talent for us is, is great. And it's also, you know, regenerating new businesses. You know, these people did their time at these large, at Kareem, for example, and they're starting their own businesses. And, and I like that kind of experience that they had, you know, at, at higher levels in these, in these fast growing companies and maybe they lost their job or whatever, they're, they're starting that, that exponential growth of, of new business generation is, is happening. And so the talent for me is, is pretty good out there. Sure. Uh, uh, just to further probe you, Trey, uh, uh, there have of course been a lot of questions that people have been asking us and of course asking leaders like yourself for sure on the future of aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, you know, especially people who have great ideas, uh, you know, who have kind of, who, who almost launched, you know, fresh projects and fresh platforms, you know, prior to the crisis. Uh, what would be your message for all the budding entrepreneurs across the world who are watching us now? And what would be your two bits uh, on the road ahead for them? Yeah, the business has to make sense. 
you know, I, I said it a couple weeks ago on a, on a panel that it's now need to have, not nice to have. You know, I mean, we are in, in a different time. And so it has to make sense now. You know, in certain cases, maybe there's, you know, hey, we need money to spend six months in development and, and get the product ready. But you're, you're throwing darts in terms of when, when the market's going to be back. If, if you can't sell something now, I'm, I'm not really interested, unfortunately, um, because it's, it's a different time. So I, I chuckled when I saw – it was a creative you know, take on ride sharing. I saw a business plan for that a couple of weeks ago, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? You know, I'm not going to look at that. Uh, so it's, it's got to make sense. It's, it's need to have, you know, it's needs based now versus, you know, some of the fluff that got funded and, and, you know, just funded, funded, funded through, through burn. It's not going to happen today. Mm -hmm. well, thanks for that. And, uh, 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 Rajiv talking about funding and, uh, and this is something you've, you've, you've done <coughs> years, helping large companies who were SMEs when you started supporting them in the early years. Uh, what changes do you think in the financial model uh, would would arise or would actually advance for supporting the SMEs uh, going forward and probably some of the large uh, you know uh, minds out there who are trying to create value for people like you and us uh, what have been what could be your thoughts on the future of financial models i think i think this is a sector that banks have and financial institutions governments uh, uh, lots of uh, support groups have really failed at. I, I really have to confess, and you know, I put my hand up on the same. Uh, SMEs, everyone likes, everyone talks about. It's almost become a buzzword where people feel it's important for creating jobs. It's an important part of the value chain of whatever industry or business you're in, whether it's healthcare that Mayer's talking about, or even it's the kind of founders that Trey is talking about, or, uh, but they are extremely important. Whether, you know, and whatever sector you look at, they're important. But what's extremely important is that we need to make this into a theme and not just a program. The programs end up being a government theme where X percent of your funds must in a bank or a financial institution go to SMEs. So banks treat that as a regulatory cost. Banks don't really treat it as something that they must do because uh, banks, still traditional banks, and a lot of that mindset is changing, uh, are, are choosing to go with uh, collateral-based lending or you know, wanting to do the age-old stuff where they look at, suppose that we look at cash flows, and then they try to use either the rigid principles of corporate lending or they start using the principles upwards of consumer lending, which and both don't apply. When you're talking about SMEs, you're talking about smart capital. You're talking about a guy who's putting his own money, he's putting his time, he's trying to run a business. He's good at some judgment intensive capabilities. For instance, if he's a doctor, he's good at doing medicine stuff. He's not good at running the administrative side of the business in the middle office or the back office. If he's a technology guy, he's good at what he does. So there is a need for. I think the ecosystem to develop. There is a need for smart capital to be offered, a complete package, try and be the partner, try to be the main banker, try to create partnerships. I think the world needs to get flat as far as SMEs are concerned too, where there is a need for uh, both the money sources as well as the sources that, that come in on the middle office and the uh, back office support system, the transaction intensive parts of the business that, can, that are always subscale for a uh, SME. And remember, uh, what, what is the definition of an SME? Unfortunately, the definitions have to be clear. A lot of people tend to give it a revenue definition. And I disagree with that. Uh, an SME can be a, a $100 million company. It can be a $1 million company. An SME is defined often by the level of governance. You know, I keep using the word governance, but it means different things in different situations. And what I mean is, is it genuinely a professional run company? Or does it mean that the common pit of funding it's common uh, between the SME owner's personal money as well as the company. He can open the drawer, take the money out. He can change numbers. He can round robin stuff. If that's the case, then however big the company may be, it's not a company that is worth lending to. And as a result, you never know whether you're doing equity financing or you're doing debt financing into a project. There is a need to make sure there's greater transparency. There's greater accounting. I think a lot of uh, linkages with the value chain upwards and downs, downwards. So there'll be, you know, a need for factoring, supply chain finance, the use of technology um, uh, to make sure that there is uh, ticket sized, deal sized uh, uh, approaches. I think there is a huge amount of focus needed on uh, SaaS solutions for them yeah. so that they can, you know, without needing a lot of customization, but you can get into support services, which can be plug and play. 
mm-hmm. and um, and and funding which comes at a certain cost but is also integrative to be able to provide them linkages to their customers mm-hmm. to their suppliers and be able to create a a, a broader ecosystem uh, such that items can flow and today technology has made that possible today technology whether it's through api linkages whether it's through data file transfers <laughs> whether it's I think the, the issue is no longer technology. The issue is the acceptance of the fact that you have to integrate your SMEs into your main value chain. And uh, uh, one thing is for sure that if we do not take care of SMEs, and again, the SME definition is very wide. As I say, there's a bunch of emerging local corporates and there are the small businesses. Whatever you look at, and the definitions vary country by country, there is a need to build in greater amount of uh, uh, structure around this. We've got to understand that they are subscale. And uh, there is a need for business process management services that need to be provided so that they can pay for use and focus on their transaction and the uh, judgment intensive side of the business. And what they're good at, not at the transaction side, which is the cost and the necessary evil they have to deal with. So that in itself leads to services companies coming through, specialized companies coming through that provide for the services. And we've seen that on data technology centers. We've seen that in uh, certain other KPOs and BPOs. I think, I think the next phase with technology coming in with uh, new service sectors coming in, there will be a huge amount of integration on the business process management side, banking and technology to be able to create this railroad on yep. which the SMEs will ride. And, and those who do it first are gonna win. So I'm a big believer on it and we must become the banker or the financial services provider of choice, but offer them predictive and analytics, offer them a decision uh, making capability to be able to choose the clients, to be able to choose the suppliers, to interface and to do things seamlessly. We have to start connecting pieces and move towards what I would call a process of convergent disruption, where all players get gathered together, link the railroad and start providing for services. Wow. I think this crisis is going to fundamentally change that. Every crisis leads to a new equilibrium. We call it the new normal, but it's going to lead to a lot of fundamental shifts. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I completely agree, Rajiv. I think it's about the integration of the entire consumer life cycle of the consumer demand yes. uh, through, through various banks. Uh, and you, you very important- Consumer or company, both ways. Uh, consumer and company, both. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, you also spoke about ticket sizes uh, from, from venture capitalists and of course, private equities. Uh, uh, Maher, uh, you've been doing this now for, for a long time. Um, uh, do you see any changes in the way investments would happen going ahead because you know you be, you be, you're, you're an operating partner with a large fund you're seeing variables in uh, in ticket sizes do you see changes in the exit periods that would come in going forward which were not the case earlier what are your thoughts look there is no doubt that uh, the situation is going to be a little bit different going forward after covid-19 we're going to see uh, lots of interest and uh, to the gentleman's point, the interest in tech, definitely. The interest in new business, definitely. Uh, investors are becoming more and more uh, uh, looking into ring fencing their investment, looking into being more conservative when they look at the financial projection. You see this happening now as we speak when they always look at the worst case scenario because financial crisis 2008, what's happening now with COVID-19, and they would like to look into a business that, is a bit more or less resilient to all what's happening. No. At least when it comes to risk management, they try to uh, limit uh, the exposure. Add to this, we see lots of consolidation that's going to happen. At the stage in the market, speaking about healthcare, you see lots of distressed assets. No. Assets that mainly coming from SMEs. And these guys were relying on day surgery and day surgery for two or three months. There is no day surgery. And these guys, they're facing serious problem. They're looking for... Uh, equity, they're looking for debt, they're looking for funding. And this is not going to go away. I see for the next six months, I'll see lots of consolidation happening. I'll see lots of assets in the market. Mm -hmm. And I see lots of vibrant sector when it comes to the healthcare, especially when we talk about the new digital aspect of healthcare and and, and the home business and all what COVID-19 created as as adjacencies. And all this is exciting to investors. But at the same time, Investors split a bit skeptic, especially in this part of the world, due to the governance issue and what happened with the big funds and what happened with the big institutions. We all heard about Abraj and NMC and then what's happening in the sector. So more and more governance is needed, more and more scrutiny is needed, more and more uh, due diligence is going into more and more details and it's taking more time and the deals is taking more uh, uh, time to, to study and structure the deals. 
Sure. So all this is like part of the new normal that we're talking about. Sure. No, perfect. Uh, Mahir, I would, just, I would just want to stay with you for just one last question before we have another question and we get into the Q&A with the audience. I think there have been a lot of questions pouring in. Uh, uh, a lot of people would actually want to know about telemedicine, Mahir. Uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a new industry. It's a new business. Um, yeah. And, uh, and a new concept, of course. Uh, could you spend a couple of time, you know, minutes talking about uh, the evolution of telemedicine and what is going to be for the future of the healthcare industry? Look, telemedicine is not new. This existed since a long period of time. It was accelerated during the, the, this crisis. Uh, telemedicine and this its, uh, original form is linking patient to doctors online. It used to be over the phone at early basic stages, and it evolved a little bit through apps where you have a video call attached to uh, uh, the conference using all these means, and now Lots of studies are showing that 50 to 70% of all the uh, visits or doctor to patient visits are done without the doctor touching the patient. So they realize that, okay, can we do this online? Can we do this in the context of their own home instead of going to the hospital? Add to this first level phone, second level video. Third level, we started talking about connection with context. Start having video start having hospital information system where the doctor can see radiology images, the doctor can see lab results and talk to the patient about it. The fourth level of, of telemedicine is when we start having connection, context, re real-time monitoring. And this is the, the new evolution that we're seeing in healthcare in, in telemedicine, where you have the patient wearing these wearable devices where you can monitor the patient at the comfort of their home you can have now many parameters that you can monitor remotely from the heart rate to the cholesterol level and, and, and. And this is connected to the doctor and the doctor can take uh, the decision based on all this. Push it one step further. We're talking about context. We're talking about virtual collaboration. We're talking about when you have multiple viewer, multiple specialties. We're talking about simulation. We're talking about the whole structure put in place. And then we start talking about prediction, simulation, digital twin, the patient, and we push it to another extreme where this is gonna be accelerated in the next two years to a level where most probably you're gonna reach a level where you don't go see a doctor unless it is extremely urgent. You yeah. can do all this. And the interesting part is the simulation and the prediction. And when you start creating your digital twin and then prediction of predicting any diseases before it's happening. And this is where we're heading when it comes to telemedicine 2.0. Fantastic. Very, very exciting, Mar. Thank you so much. We'll just have one last round of discussion quickly. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll appreciate if we can just spend about two or three minutes between ourselves, the four of us, and then quickly uh, launch the questions. Uh, uh, we spoke about a software aspect a while back, Rajiv. You did start about talking about the software aspects in organizations and, and boards. Uh, I would like to have this question answered by Trey. Uh, Trey, what we've also observed over the last two or three months, and I'm sure it is across the world, is that a lot of free discussions and information exchanges have, have somewhat uh, replaced the uh, conventional uh, management presentations. Uh, do you foresee a change in communication styles at the leadership levels um, as we speak today? Yeah, I, uh, I work for Saudi Aramco, and so it, it's kind of its own entity, but in my portfolio companies, uh, we're run pretty flat as it is. Um, you know, so I, in my opinion, I don't know, maybe this is probably accelerated things, you know, with the management team and the board. I've, I've had you know, several board meetings since January, and can't say they've taken on completely different forms, but it's, I'm, I'm thrilled that the CEOs have been asking more questions than, than normal, although they ask a lot of questions um, and ask for advice as it is. Yeah. But, you know, so I can't say that I've, I've seen that in my venture back, you know, scaling, fast scaling, technology companies because it's a pretty flat organization as it is you know it might have started five years ago and now they've got a couple hundred employees uh, so they don't, they don't know any different if that makes sense so it might be better for the other two gentlemen 
Rajiv, would you have any any closing thoughts on that? Yeah, I just like to add to what Ray said, and I think to your point, I, I think, I think there is uh, communication channels are far more open today uh, between management and board members, management and uh, senior management than their own people, uh, between board members themselves, uh, and uh, but there is certainly a level of informality of access, but I don't think there is a lack of formality of process. So in some ways, I'm on Trey's camp here because if you really want to have a meaningful uh, discussion, remember, the roles are very different at the leadership level to go ahead and make decision. And I'm just adding to what Mahar said in such an exciting fashion on how predictive uh, uh, digital twins, et cetera, are created and you can personalize your decisions. Yeah. How can anyone make a good decision off the cuff unless it's a gut related decision? Mm. So I think the formal presentation process has become, uh, has not necessarily gone away. But the need to have a lot of fluff has probably gone away. I think discussions and presentations and analysis are, are still very much part of the discussion. But they, they're very pointed. They're very quick. They can be repeated. Uh, you know, you, you can get a call in one day and say, hey, can we have a call tomorrow? You have management calling before the call. There's a strategy discussion. You're running an IPO. Can we do this? We're running it in an M&A. Can we talk about it before? Can we understand your concerns? And yeah. people react a lot faster. But eventually all of this gets condensed. And I think it necessarily must because you need convergence of view. Right. When you are at a leadership team level or at a board level and you're discussing alternatives, there is no way you can take a single decision. Or influence. Yeah. So the lack of a formal process would actually worry me. But uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's the what, but it's the how. The, you can have an informality and a fast access, quick decision making, informal discussion, a huge amount of relationship bonding. Successful sure. boards are those, in my view, where people bond with each other better. People trust with each, trust each other. And I'm sure I can see Myra and Trey smiling. I guess they agree with me. If you don't trust the team, if you don't trust each other, then, and if you need as a board to be involved in every element of a business, then there's something oh. wrong. Sure. So on that note, Rajiv, it's not about the what, but it's the how. Uh, uh, we have about 12 minutes and there are a lot of questions. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, people in the audience. I'll try my best uh, to take most of them and have them answered by the three gentlemen uh, uh, without causing much delay. Maher, there's a question for, for, for you uh, from somebody in the audience. Oh, it's Elizabeth. Hi, hi, Elizabeth. How are you? Uh, uh, Maher, where is the greatest opportunity around government and private healthcare collaboration in the GCC? Well, in the GCC, each and every country has an initiative, a PPP initiative. It started here in UAE and it moved to Saudi and from Saudi, Oman, and then Qatar, and then Kuwait and Bahrain. Everybody realized that when it comes to healthcare, the public sector cannot shoulder the healthcare burden on their own. They need to work with the private sector. The private sector can do it faster, can do it cheaper, and they can play the role uh, as a public. They can play the role of regulator, not operator. They realize this. But unfortunately, the rules and the regulation and the laws were not there to allow these PPP. Personally, I work on a couple of projects. We struggle at early stages to, between the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Health. And how can you procure this based on a PPP? Uh, it should be a tender. It should be public procurement. So lots of consultants have been working for, for the past two, three years to put together a solid, robust operating mechanism and rules and regulation to manage and govern the relation between the public and the private. A life example is the Saudi, what Saudi they're doing when they're digitizing their healthcare, when they're privatizing a couple of sectors, the cluster that they're creating, they're doing radiology, they're doing lab, they're doing dialysis, Ministry of Health in UAE, they're doing the same. Oman, they're looking into doing the same. So the, the, the train left the station. The PPP between public and the private is moving ahead. Now it's a question of, we're managing the internal acceptance and change management because all these guys, they were working as government for a long period of time. Costing was not there. Coding was not there. And then suddenly now we're bringing the private sector that is working on efficiency, productivity, operational excellence. So you need to create the synergy and you need to create really a partnership between both sectors. And it started. All the countries, I would say. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Don, uh, Maher. Uh, Elizabeth, I hope that answers your question. Uh, it's a very interesting question, the next one. Uh, 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 the question is, how does a leader actually go about creating this much needed resilience uh, and the preparation for it, apart from keeping cash aside for a rainy day? Um, uh, would you want to take it, Raji, followed by Trey? Uh, I don't, you can just decide. Trey? 
Would you like to, or should I take it? Uh, yeah, I'll go quick. So, you know, a lot of times my my CEOs have have fought through, you know, missing payroll and you know, when are they going to get the next money or that big customer. I, I don't want to say they're used to it, um, but this isn't, you know, they started a business with their own cash, you know, and bootstrapped it to the point where they, they got someone to invest venture capital. Um, at, you know, how much, it, it's not black and white, you know, it's, it's a, a gut kind of decision, you know, again, there were a lot of businesses that just continued to raise money and, and fund through losses. And that was the business model, you know, for many years before this pandemic. Uh, and, and again, I don't think that's going to work today. So it, it might change that gut, you know, of, of our CEOs a, a bit, you know, cause this was definitely a slap in the face. Um, it's it's great. I don't have that answer. You know, it's it's a great question, and if that that caller can can answer it for me, I'd love to know the answer myself. Um, unfortunately, because of the technical situation on the virtual platform, we cannot really have the two-way uh, communication. But uh, uh, Rajiv, would you also like to add to what? Uh, what yeah, I just. Mentioned? I, I think Ray, Ray, uh, uh, Trey has actually raised a good point, but uh, and that's a very interesting question because I, uh, to me, resilience is going to be one of the biggest uh, positive outcomes out of this business. Resilience in terms of making sure there's continuity, of course, but resilience goes beyond that. Resilience also goes beyond liquidity. Liquidity, of course, is very basic. We all talk about it, but I think there's a fundamental need to build sustainable businesses. And sustainability is no longer just a question of environment. Sustainability is a question of building businesses which have positive unit economics, a, a genuine model that can be done. Uh, and it's, it's important to also reimagine the business model. You know, the word re-engineering is out. The word of automating or digitizing the way you did your business is out. Today, you need to reimagine. Start from ground zero. Look at exactly what the customer wants. Look at the ecosystem and the railroad that exists. Do not hesitate not to own every part of, uh, of the delivery chain. Make sure that you do business in the most efficient way. And I, you know, I'm linking back to the telemedicine example that Mahir gave. How can you personalize? How can you prevent disaster? And how can you uh, create efficiency? Right. So it's, it's personalization as well as predictive nature of businesses. And that can only happen if you segment, create segments of your business whatever business you're in, whether you're in the medicine business, whether you're in the healthcare business, the education business, the financial services business, remember people have the same need, but how you deliver the value proposition changes based on the person. So your resilience and the stacking of your resources have to be based on the revenue uh, and the risk adjusted dynamics of your business. And I think that is what was lost in the last seven, eight years. We've, we've, we've had such low price debt induced growth in the world that uh, you know, it's almost been like a risk off. Everyone is saying, fine, I can't get high quality, high yielding assets, so let me go for equities. So you find equities are expensive, you go for all kinds of venture capital investments and you keep doing successive pricing. And very often the same venture fund goes out and does successive rounds themselves. Now that's a governance fail. That's something where you don't even know how to, and I'm not gonna name players here, but we've, we've all read about how these things fail. But if you run a genuinely sustainable business, yeah. you build resilience around teams, your model, your unit economics, make sure you genuinely create segments of your clients, and then you build a whole delivery mechanism to make it happen. And if it's scalable and the market is large enough, I don't think you can fail. And those are the kind of businesses that investors are looking for. Those are the kind of businesses that people want. And finally, they should be run by passionate people who genuinely are disruptive by being creative and innovative. Those who can walk the talk, those who are high on in integrity, and those who know how to execute. Unfortunately, there are too many entrepreneurs, but very few real men who out there who can drive a business. And you know, I've started businesses. It takes a lot to be able to make sure that you're successful. Perfect, uh, Rajiv. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, I hope uh, the the person who asked the question got the answer. Uh, I think it's a fantastic answer from both you gentlemen. Uh, the next question comes from somebody in Europe. Uh, the question is: Is the region going to see an increase in corporate debt with companies taking advantage of the low global interest rates. Uh, there has been an increase in corporate bond issuances in the past few months in the US and in Europe. If yes, will it be to shore up OPEX or continue investing in CAPEX? Rajiv, uh, you would... I, 
I think it's a wonderful question, and I guess. Sorry, it was it pointed towards you, Rajiv. Uh, the person wanted to hear it from okay. you. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, please. Yes, I I know there've been several issues in the U.S. and um, uh, there've been issuances where uh, people have successfully raised money, and uh, very clearly there, there's going to be two two kinds of, and uh, two or three kinds of funding that will happen. Uh, there's clearly going to be a lot of um, uh, money chasing existing businesses. With, who are clearly cash trapped or who have maturities coming in very fast. So there is an opportunity to just refinance some of the debt where the business models are fundamentally viable, but they just have a situation where the payments are getting coincident at this point of time and it's difficult to finance. So whether it's bridge finance or it's a new issuance or sometimes it's a refinance of an existing facility or a little more, that's bound to happen. Sure. I think um, uh, when you talk about the region, uh, it is no different. Uh, there will be players and certainly better players will be able to raise money, will possibly raise money. You're already seeing in banks that uh, existing players who may not have used their existing limits are now drawing down on those limits because they're all shoring up their own uh, liquidity reserves and liquidity buffers. The question is, where is this money going to go? At this point of time, I don't think a lot of this money is going to be used for new CapEx or capital formation. There's going to be a fair bit of wait and watch. A lot of this money is actually being used to create liquidity, draw down from banks, uh, extend your tenors and deal with the ambiguity that you're dealing in the market. Sure. And uh, there may be, I think, three to six months later, as we start seeing some stabilization, there will be many more issuances that may happen. Part of it may be towards, uh, you know, funding some acquisitions. They could be M&As, they, or they could be uh, certain other restructuring opportunities, etc., that exist. And then I think perhaps a year, year and a half later, when we start seeing active growth, there's a sense of uh, confidence coming back. You're going to see new growth. And, and again, I'm using year and year and a half with a bit of caution, assuming we get a vaccine. Uh, but in the absence of all that, I don't think in a, in a world where we have excess capacity, a lot of uncertainty, uh, whether a lot of money will go into new capital generation. I think a lot of money will right now go in shoring up your buffers. A lot of it will go in restructuring your debt positions oh. in making sure you can refinance your debt, extend turners, and if possible, even. And governments in, in some ways have given you the moratorium at this time. Almost every country has done so. And, and this period allows banks to be able to, you know, target their clients. So they've taken the initial shock out. It's a bit like a medical situation where you've given them the initial injection, get them live. And now uh, they will find out who can afford what and, you know, money needs to go to uh, the right segment. Hopefully not to zombies. I mean, zombie companies should not be financed, in my view. And I think at this point of time, excess capacity is run by zombies should be allowed to fail. Thanks, Rajiv. Uh, for for uh, adhering to the timelines, we will take five more minutes because there are too many questions and uh, you know, it's going to be difficult for me. Um, the next question is uh, for uh, both. In fact, uh, interesting question for Maher and Trey both. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, it's uh, in the Middle East uh, and African countries and, and Eastern European countries, uh, technology and healthcare were not as advanced as, as some of the more advanced countries or regions in the US or in Asia Pacific. Do you think that the consumers can expect a fast forward in the technology sector and the healthcare sector? If yes, what are the two largest differences consumers will face uh, for themselves in the technology as well as the healthcare sector? Sorry, long question, but yeah. Well, look, uh, uh... I fully agree, and this is why I strongly believe that we're going to see a leapfrogging. We're not going to see a gradual movement of, of tech and healthcare. I can give you a couple of examples that I witnessed myself and I work on. In, in, in countries, without mentioning the country in Africa, they don't have landline and suddenly they have telecom. They have 4Gs and they have phone. We created a whole program around midwives, equipping these midwives with a mobile phone, ultrasound, portable ultrasound, and these girls were moving around in the villages, securing that you have safe pregnancy, safe delivery, and giving high percentage of survival for the newborn baby. Just with a couple of equipment, and I tell you, the, the whole program was funded from outside the country. The training, the equipment, the technology, and the tech, we used the technology and abused the technology to make sure we can give these ladies the right tools to be able to leapfrog a system where they didn't have a doctor to suddenly they have somebody connected to a hospital in the city. And if there is some complication, they can read the images immediately and do what is needed. And we're going to see more and more of these leapfrogging, leapfrogging technology happening in countries like Africa, part of the Middle East. Definitely. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, my uh, Trey. Would you have your two cents uh, on the same question? Because uh, the person asked you as well. Sure. Uh, um, you know, again, I think it's just adapting to to today's world. Does the consumer and businesses, for for that matter, you know, stand to benefit? I, I think so. I mean, look at look at what we're on right now, Zoom. You know, I maybe I did a couple of these in the last year, but now it's an everyday occurrence. Um, for the consumer and businesses, you know, the whole distributed workforce, um, th there's going to be a lot of improvements. And I've seen some cool applications. FinTech is another one. I, I mean, we were on a great trajectory here, fixing the unbanked situation in, in the region and globally. And all these things have been expedited. When I got here in, in Saudi, you know, it was a cash society. <laughs> I mean, you had... The, the merchants didn't have, you know, machines to take your credit card. And in fact, one of them, you know, for a substantial purchase said, if you use your credit card, it's going to cost you 3% more. And I'm like, if Visa finds that out, you're in big trouble. Yeah. And now they're recommending don't use cash. So it's forcing, you know, a, a relatively good trajectory, in my opinion, pre-pandemic. You know, so there's going to be a lot more solutions and, and technology available for Businesses. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great. So we'll just take the last two questions uh, before we uh, wind up. Uh, Rajiv, there's a question for you. Uh, we'll make it really quick. Uh, the question is, uh, during every crisis, uh, its infrastructure and financial services uh, are the sectors which go down first and the last to come up. Uh, will these sectors buck the trend this time around? I think... Uh, uh... I don't entirely agree with that view because um, the easiest sectors when you want to revitalize and depending on where the funding is coming from, I think governments are going to obviously look at ways by which they can uh, focus on the high performance sectors. And by high performance, I mean from a macro standpoint uh, where money can go in a manner such that multiple sectors get impacted in a positive way and typically infrastructure, real, real estate, et cetera, uh, are sectors that, um, you know, uh, uh, can be controlled by the government and they're the best way to get people employed and best way to get the economy going in some shape or form. This is the period of time where the government and public invest investments in uh, building uh, confidence is going to be needed. Private spend is going to be very anemic for a while. And at the same time, uh, we there is going to be a reduced capacity of the private end to do that till there is a, uh, there is a uh, capability to do so. Financial services this time round, I think, is far stronger. And my sense is financial services are going to play a very critical part. Uh, because as you've seen, uh, this time round, a lot of the transmission or some of the liquidity measures that are being done, as well as the grants and support mechanisms that every government, you've seen that in the Middle East, you've seen that in India, you've seen that in Europe, every, and you've seen that in Africa, every place in Asia, uh, it's going through, government, uh, through, going through banks. And I think that is an efficient way to do so. Because at least you make sure that you don't run a moral hazard. So I think financial uh, um, uh, services um, companies are going to play a critical role in this turnaround. This time around, they're not the problem. This time now, the financial services industry is actually part of the solution. Mm -hmm. However, I think the extended moratoriums that exist will cause a lag. I think the first source of money will go to the larger ticket corporate end and people who can sit back and utilize it. And then there will be, I think the smarter players are going to be those who can figure out who the small businesses are, who those individuals are, who those households are, who look impaired today and uh, are good to lend to. So I think if I was to look at it from a scoring mechanism, typically scores look at, you know, who's a bad customer and who's a good customer. We should now be looking at not a degree of badness because everyone looks good. We should, we should start looking at the degrees of goodness. So, you know, everyone's going to look bad, but the important thing is you need to find who's less bad than the other. Because the important thing about financial services is the ability, it's not just the ability to pay, it's the intent to pay. And, um, and I think there's going to be a lot of interesting structures. There's going to be a lot more work in restructuring opportunities of financial sector, sure. special Thanks, situations Rajiv. and changes. Thanks, Raji. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'll just take this last question. And uh, this question, I think, uh, I think we can have all three gentlemen answer this. Uh, I'm the CHRO, Chief Human Resources Officer of a very large multinational uh, healthcare and devices company. Uh, I've been finding it difficult to hire uh, uh, CXO level opportunities or CXO level mandates for, for my organization because either the sentiments of talent is low or companies like ours is also skeptical about getting in new talent in this region. 
what should an HR leader like myself really do in these times? Mahir, to you. Well, I don't, I don't think the, the, uh, we are running out of talent in this part of the world. We still have really a good reservoir of talent, especially nowadays. I see lots of, uh, especially when it comes to healthcare. Uh, there is not uh, an issue of, of finding the talent. It's a question of, at this stage, there is a kind of, uh, from the talent side, when it comes to multinational, it used to be in the past, it's like a multinational is the safe heaven. Uh, uh, from both sides, there was a kind of a pact between the employee and the company, the company and the employee. Trust has been broken for, for many years now between multinational and the talent. And the talent is really looking thinking twice, is this the company that I would like to work with? And the company would think that, okay, is this guy is not really committed and it's not going to give me the next five to 10 years, is not going to work. So we need to reconcile the talent with the company, especially multinational and the multinational with the talent. And the trust has been broken from both sides. Sure. And people that they are happy, satisfied where they are, they don't tend to move. Although recently we've seen lots of, uh, people looking to better opportunities, especially what this uh, offered. But again, I go back to the talent and uh, the issue of trust between the company and the, uh, the talent. All right. Uh, I would love to squeeze in a few more questions. Uh, unfortunately, I would like to respect everybody's time uh, on the panel and of course, uh, all the people, uh, the audience. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rajiv, Trey, Maher for a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, I think uh, a lot of interesting questions uh, from the audience. I, on behalf of EMA Partners, would like to thank each one of you for your time, uh, for your very, very patient hearing of some very, very good questions and answers from the panel. Thank you so much. Apologies uh, if we could not take up all questions in the interest of time and, 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 and sanity. Uh, I would also like to thank the team at EMA Partners Dubai and the global team of EMA Partners for their support in making these leadership conversation series an ongoing value add for everybody. Thank you all once again. Stay safe, stay well, uh, God bless. If there are any questions that we could not answer, please feel free to uh, write them to me and I promise I'll get them answered to the three, to the three people who are there uh, on the screen right now. Thank you once again, Rajiv, Maher, and Trey for your time. Thank you. Thank really you appreciate Thank you, uh, everything. And, and hopefully we see ourselves soon physically. Yeah. All right. Thank hopefully you. soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.